The 805 Focus is brought to you in part by Nonprofit Connect. Nonprofit Connect provides superior leadership tools and resources so nonprofit leaders and board members can make valuable decisions to move their organization forward to a sustainable and vibrant future. More information on services online at nonprofitconnect.org. Welcome to 805 Focus. I'm Dr. Sandra Sinclair with Nonprofit Connect, and we will be bringing you the latest on your favorite nonprofits. So get ready to be inspired. Our special guest today is Nadia Seal Faith, and Nadia is from the Santa Barbara Zoo. Welcome, Nadia. Hi, thank you. Happy to be here. Oh gosh, I'm so eager to hear what you have to tell us. Now, tell me your um, department at the zoo. So I have the privilege of working with the Santa Barbara Zoo's Conservation and Science Department, and I am the oh. Conservation and Science Associate. So that basically just means that I help to facilitate the zoo's involvement in our local conservation programs. Okay, well, I want to hear all about that. <laughs> and you know, it's funny because when, when people ask me my title, I get I get a variety of, of answers, but or at least responses, uh -huh. um, but usually there's kind of a big question mark like conservation and science associate. So sometimes depending on how much time I have, sometimes yeah. I'll just say I'm a biologist because people mm. can relate to that. Okay, okay. Um, but what I essentially do is I help to connect the zoo to our local conservation programs. And I love the Santa Barbara Zoo because the, the zoo and you know, in all of its wisdom, has chosen to really focus its effort in our local conservation programs. Because I don't know if you knew this, but California is actually a biodiversity hotspot. It's one of 25 in the world, which means that our collection of local flora and fauna is um, so pretty much endemic to our area and just not found anywhere else. No, and I didn't so, know that. Yeah, especially the the floristic province, so specifically the California floristic province is uh, you know, just highly concentrated in rich biodiversity. Um, you find plants like on the Channel Islands that you just ah. can't find mm. anywhere in the mm. world. And so we at the Santa Barbara Zoo said, you know, if we're gonna focus on conservation, why not just focus on the programs within our own backyard? And so we work with federal, state agencies, other nonprofits, mm -hmm. and we're able to kind of utilize our own staff expertise. I mean, we have experts in the field. We have experts that, you know, work with uh, wildlife and mm -hmm. endangered species on a regular day just as a part of their jobs and keeping. You know, we have people that are on our facilities staff that you know, are experts in, in building, you know, different enclosures for mm. wildlife. Oh. And so we can work with these local programs and, um, and basically just really help them out. And so my, my job is basically to connect the zoo to all of those different ah. organizations. You know, I'm beginning to understand a little teeny bit about how complex the zoo really is. All these things happening behind the scenes that I bet a lot of people, myself included, have no idea about. So I'm really interested in your area. And you know what, it, it's, it's great that you mentioned that, Cinder, because a lot of people go to a zoo and when they walk in the gates, they see what's there right in front of them. Mm -hmm. they, they're able to go on grounds, they're able to see our beautiful flamingo exhibit, yeah. our, you know, our new Australian walkabout. And when people hear zoo, they just think of the animals that are on grounds. Uh, but the truth is the, the modern zoo is really moving away from a, you know, a menagerie collection mm -hmm. and really trying to answer that question, why do we exist? You know, why are we continuing to exist as zoos? And one is the animals in our collection, one is the animals in our care. You know, we're able to provide for those individuals. They're able to be ambassadors, but they're able to be ambassadors to their wild counterparts. And ah. our area of conservation has been helping answer that question of why is the modern zoo and what is the modern zoo? And in fact, we have incorporated conservation within our mission statement because we believe so, so much into it. 
And so what we have found that we're able to do is we're able to connect um, to these other agencies. We're able to connect to Fish and Wildlife Service. Mm -hmm. We're able to connect to the National Park Service. We're able to connect to um, other local nonprofits um, like the Nature Conservancy and oh. Channel Island Restoration oh, oh, yeah. and, and many, many, many others. I could probably spend all day just listing off our, our, our partners. Um, but we can give them our, our expertise. For example, you know, one of our biggest programs that we've been involved with is California condors. And oh, right. while we have condors on exhibit, a lot of our time and effort actually goes into helping out the Fish and Wildlife Service with the Southern California mm. condor population. Mm. Uh, we also help the National Park Service with their red-legged frog work, and mm. we help the U.S. Forest Service survey, survey for arroyo toads. So even though we don't have red-legged frogs and arroyo toads in our collections on ground, mm -hmm. we actually do a lot for them. <laughs> the red-legged frog, one of my favorite facts too, is that it's our state amphibian. Oh. So I didn't know if you knew that. I don't think I did. <laughs> and actually, a little, a little fun story here is that um, it only became our state amphibian because an elementary school actually went up to Sacramento to petition oh, that they gosh. wanted the red-legged frog as the state amphibian, and Sacramento listened. Apparently, the Sacramento will listen to an elementary school when they want the red-legged oh, frogs. So. <laughs> Wait, an amphibian. So did we have a different amphibian before the red-legged frog? That's a really good question. <laughs> I know that the red-legged frog is our amphibian now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if most states, or yeah, I wonder if most states have a uh, official amphibian. I'm sure that there's some. I'm sure that there's some that have official amphibians, but they're probably not as cool as the red-legged yeah, frog, right. I'm sure <laughs> which none is the of them largest cool. uh, largest native frog in the, yeah. in California. <laughs> wow. So um, conservation. That is just. Oh, I wanted to ask you. So you folks are part of the um, alliance of all the different museums and yeah. things that are good. And so. And so you have a special um, climate project. Tell me about that. Yeah, so uh, we're working towards the, um, the climate project. And really, this is going to, this has fallen a little bit more under our educational oh, umbrella. Okay. Okay. Um, and you know, our education department is doing a lot of great work incorporating that into their curriculums. And we're able to work collaboratively with them because we're able to kind of focus on the main conservation programs that, that we're working with, you know, mm -hmm. like condors, like island foxes, like yeah, red-legged yeah, yeah. frogs, um, like otters, plovers, mo western monarchs. Those are kind of our big six conservation programs. And we're able to look at the ecosystems and habitats. And they, they have a big variety. I mean, you think about where California condors range, yeah. they're, they actually really like going over to the ranches and the dairy farms and, you know, circling around seeing what might be available for them to eat. <laughs> but you think about the Inland Valley, you think about that breadbasket yeah. of California all the way over to the, the Channel Islands and where, where sea otters play a niche too within the, the National Marine Sanctuaries. And so, you know, all of those different ecosystems require different actions that can help combat, you know, climate change. And so we can focus our education and our curriculum around those species and then be able to talk about climate change and you know bring out that message so here's the california condor this is why it's an amazing species and this is what you can do and those individual mm -hmm. actions can help to to push forward the climate change yeah. uh, you know message and mission that is great so once again i am just amazed at all of the sort of intricate science that's behind, oh, I'm taking my family to the zoo. Oh, honey, look at that cute uh, flamingo over there. Look at that condor over there. And, and, but for, for listeners, for people uh, who visit the zoo to understand what's really behind that, it's so complex. Yeah, I mean, it, there is complexity, uh, absolutely. I mean, every single individual that we have in our care, you know, uh, has 
a part in conservation. You know, we have, it, conservation tends to focus a little bit more on the threatened and endangered mm. species. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you have both your animals and your plants. You know, we like to be able to focus on those. We don't like to forget the plants. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, they, they do play an important part because they're all a part of their, that, that ecosystem. So we do have animals within our collection that um, are in what we call SSPs, or Species Survival Programs. Oh. And the great thing that zoos are able to do is they're able to have kind of a, a genetic resource in case there's anything that may happen to their wild counterparts, especially if they are a critically endangered species. Mm. Take the Amur leopard, for instance. It's probably the most endangered cat in the entire world. And yet we at the Santa Barbara Zoo are able to have a pair of Amur leopards. They were successfully able to have a cub, kitten, <laughs> Marta, who is now out with her mom, Ajax. Um, you can see them at the zoo yeah. and they're adorable. If you ever have the chance, I would definitely recommend looking at them. They will make you smile whether you want it or not. Um, but it's also contributing to the, you know, that uh, pool, that captive pool. So if for whatever reason something happens to their wild counterparts, we have that captive resource. One thing that zoos were able to do actually for the California condor, the, the captive breeding program was actually really, really important to the condor's recovery. Uh -huh. So in back in the 80s, well actually when they were first listed in 1967, um, you know, they said, all right, if anything happens to this population, if it gets down to too dangerously low of a level, we're gonna take them all into captivity. And so in the early 80s that happened and all of the remaining 23 individuals, there was only 23 left in the world, Gosh. had to be brought into captivity. And fortunately, um, through biologists out in the field watching these guys just diligently, they found out that they were able to what's called double clutching. So condors only lay one egg typically every other year. Oh. But if something happens to that egg early enough in the season, they're able to lay a second or maybe even a third egg. Wow. So in captivity, they were actually able to replicate um, that situation by pulling the egg, art artificially incubating it or giving it to a foster pair. Wow. Get them to lay a second or even a third egg and double or triple the amount of chicks that they were able to produce. And so this species that actually takes quite a long time to, to reproduce they're not like the island foxes that yeah. will just yeah. you know go off and have pups every year yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or two or three you know they were able to get um, these individuals back up and so they started re-releasing in the late 80s and from 23 individuals in the 80s we're at a total of about 500 now oh my they're still definitely very critically endangered um, a little under half of those are in captivity but the captive side of things have been so important for that. They've been able to provide that resource out to the wild. That's amazing. So I'm, you know, so I'm thinking about, I've heard people sometimes say, oh, those poor animals, they're in captivity. Um, you know, we ought to let them out in the wild. But what they don't realize is all the sort of science that goes behind what, what, what you're doing with those animals. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we we provide um, a huge amount of welfare. I mean, that is something that our, our animal care staff, they have been amazing at. And part of being at the Santa Barbara Zoo is that we're under this umbrella of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Okay. And we are specifically accredited. We're only one of a handful of institutions that believe about 240, 236, uh -huh. seven, around there of all of the, you know, facilities that hold wild animals in the country. And that's not to say over the world. I mean, there's different accreditation standards um, elsewhere too, um, like EASA, the European Association of mm -hmm. Zoos and Aquariums. But within here, we have a very specific set of guidelines that guide our welfare, that guide um, everything so that all of those individuals that you see in our enclosures, um, they're looked at, they're, they have their welfare assessments. I mean, down to the, the smallest little invertebrate. I, I gotta tell you, we, we, one of our conservation programs is the Western Snowy Plover mm -hmm. Rescue, Rehab and Release Program. Um, it was you know, started up in about 2016 and you know, it's been growing. So we take in abandoned eggs and chicks um, mm -hmm. from our local be beaches. Oh. Our fabulous team of animal care experts, they rear, rehab, 
fledged these chicks and then were able to release them into the wild. And they're banded, so we've been able to track them wow. over the years and we've actually seen that some have gone on to nest. But what I was floored with was that last year we're reviewing our program, we, we got a new building you know, so that we can ha house all of this plover care in one area. And one of the keepers brought up the fact that you know, we, we feed them out little mealworms and other little invertebrates, crickets, and uh -huh. we try to do it in a way that allows them to learn how to hunt so that they can yeah. thrive and survive in the wild. And one of the keepers brought up that we need to do invertebrate welfare. So even these animals that were, they're, they're destined to be fed out. <laughs> but our keepers, our animal care staff, are also looking and making sure that they have a good quality of life before they go out and oh be fed. My gosh. So it's not just you know our, our big charismatic megafauna. Yes, it's yes, down yes. to the smallest invertebrates, oh. and that's the kind of you know care that our welfare team within our zoo and being under that AZA accreditation. You know yeah. these are the types of people that we have in our zoo. So, so if I were to go on your website, mm -hmm. would I be able to see some of this information there? Uh, yes, yes, so there is, um, we have a fabulous website and I have to thank our marketing team for that because they're wonderful, um, but there is a section on conservation that oh. describes all of our conservation programs that we that we work with. Oh, so there's like a drop down menu. There is a drop down menu, yes. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. And so people can go in there and find out. They can also, I would imagine since you're, you're a 501c3, they can go on that website and hit that donate now button. They can, they can. And we, we really appreciate, obviously, any donations. Uh, we love our members too, because mm -hmm. um, what has been great is when we started, kind of really started our conservation department, uh, we actually um, set aside, you know, portions of all memberships to be directly donated to conservation. So oh, I love our members because our members good? help to, yeah. to fund you know, the work that I do. I'm able to get out into the field. I'm able to use very expensive you know, spotting scopes, which we need to. If I'm trying to discern whether that's a sea otter or a sea, you know, a harbor seal or just a big kelp bed, yeah. I need a really nice scope to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, we, we appreciate anybody that comes on and is able to donate, especially if they're able to become members. Yeah, that's great. And so um, becoming a member, mm -hmm. and you have different levels, um, becoming a member is really important too. And they can do that on the website. Yep, yep, you can. And you know, being a member also gives you a lot of access to, uh -huh. to benefits. I mean, we have specific members events only. Mm -hmm. We have, um, you know, different times that members are able to come in. Yeah. Um, you know, just different perks, but it also gives back to the zoo. And um, while they're on that, on your website, mm -hmm. they can probably go and look for volunteer opportunities. I'm sure you have many of those, huh? Yeah, yeah, we do. We have various levels of volunteer mm -hmm. opportunities, various ways that you can get um, get in and you know, really start understanding how a zoo works and how to give back to the zoo. So there's um, volunteer opportunities under our education team. There's volunteer opportunities as being a docent. Ah. There's volunteer opportunities. Actually, I started out as a volunteer with oh, the Santa Barbara did you? Zoo. Yeah, I. I started out as a um, keeper aide um, mm. on, the, on what they called the upper bird line. So it was the condors, the eagles, and, and everything. And that's how I got my start. Um, we also help to manage volunteers with our partners. Um, you know, we for a long time managed nest volunteers through the California Condor mm. program. And so we're able to also, again, with, within my role, able to connect people that are interested in wildlife to people that need help with wildlife. Wow, so a lot can be found on <laughs> your website. Yes. And so if someone wants to volunteer, you give training for that, for whatever yes. they want to volunteer for? Yeah, absolutely. We have a very robust um, volunteer training program. Um, and even if maybe you're a, a student looking to come up, because you know sometimes it's tough to, to get into the wildlife world if you're under 18. We do have you know junior count counselor opportunities, and um, we also have a teen conservation club, mm -hmm. and they've been fabulous. Uh, we've just really started to work with them. They've been able to build um, western, western snowy plover exclosures oh. um, that actually help to protect nests on the beach from predators coming in and getting those eggs, and so that's been great. 
uh, they're probably going to help build some bluebird nest boxes on one of our refuge and so you know they, they've been great in helping to give back they also you know were able to create their own awareness day you know within our zoo create um, art facts and infographics for World Otter Day and able they're able to connect with their peers uh, on our grounds and able to connect our guests with our conservation mission. That sounds fabulous. So, so we have about a minute left. Is there another message you'd like for our audience to know about the zoo? Conservation? <laughs> well, I mean, conservation, uh, zoos act um, as great ambassadors for our, our conservation programs. I mean, they act twofold. One is we can connect our expert staff to these conservation programs, but the second is we can connect our guests uh, mm. to our conservation mission oh. because it's not just one person taking one action. Mm -hmm. It's many people taking one action. So if we can not only listen to our guests, hear how they recreate, hear mm -hmm. how they interact with their environment, mm -hmm. then we can better fit that message and hopefully, you know, our guests, our individuals can take that action that can really make the impact. That's fabulous. Nadia, thank you so much yeah. for all of your great work and for sharing that with us today on oh, 805. Oh, my pleasure. It's been great getting to know you and chatting with you, Cinder. Yes, and thank you for joining us on 805 Focus and we'll see you next time.